Welcome to the Pi Alpha Alpha Fall Colloquium, a vocation to public service. My name is Kamara Evans, and I'm the current president of the Villanova chapter of Pi Alpha Alpha. Pi Alpha Alpha is a national honor society which promotes excellence in the study and practice of public administration and public affairs. Our Villanova chapter, which was chartered in March of 2010, hosts biannual meetings to provide educational and informational sessions for Pi Alpha Alpha members, as well as the Villanova Master of Public Administration students, alumni, faculty, and university administrators. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight, and thank you to everyone out there in cyberspace who's watching us as we live cast this. Um, it is through the incredible support of our chapter advisor, Father Richard Jacobs, our secretary, Robert Fogel, public, public administration dean, Dr. Catherine Wilson, and the ever-supportive MPA assistant director, Richard Boston, and executive assistant, Michelle Griffin, who couldn't be here with us tonight, that we are able to celebrate the study and practice of public service. Every year at our fall program, we invite an individual to speak about what it means to devote one's life to public service uh, and life in the public sector. And tonight, we have a very special guest who will talk to us about what lifelong commitment to public service truly means. This year's keynote speaker is Mr. Frank Larkin, who is the Sergeant at Arms and Door Keeper for the United States Senate. As Chief Law Enforcement and Executive Officer of the Senate, Mr. Larkin enforces the rules of the Senate, provides a range of technical and administrative services to the senators in their D.C. offices and their state offices, and maintains security in the Capitol and Senate office buildings. Mr. Larkin's extensive public service experience began as a special warfare operator with the Navy SEALs. Quite impressive. He subsequently served as a municipal police officer and detective, a U.S. Secret Service officer, and a member of the Senior Executive Service. Mr. Larkin holds a BA degree in criminal justice and an MS degree in public administration from Villanova University. Mr. Larkin will share his story with us and we will follow with a 15 to 20 minute question and answer period, so please be sure to write down all of your questions that you have throughout the address. Without further delay, please help me in welcoming Mr. Frank Clark. Thank you. And Kamira, I want to thank you, Rob, Bridget, and especially uh, Father uh, Jacobs and uh, Dr. Wilson, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, visit the campus. And uh, an old friend, Dr. Brian Jones. Um, <laughs> if it doesn't go well tonight, you know who to blame. <laughs> as you know, I have a very strong Villanova ties. And uh, graduating in 1982, as uh, Kamira mentioned, with a uh, uh, degree in sociology, with criminal justice as a uh, subspecialty, and then uh, in 86 with the human organization science uh, discipline with the uh, public administration uh, concentration. The university has always been dear to my heart and uh, have had uh, a couple uh, nieces and nephews that have attended the university since I've been here, so they're keeping the uh, tradition strong. And I want to recognize my uh, sister Sue, who uh, is with the uh, nursing school here. and. Uh, is kind of my is my inside source. Uh, so once I got the uh, invitation come up here, she uh, she did a lot of the the, the pre-trip survey. I had a lot of fun on this campus, and uh, hopefully, no one still, except for Brian, maybe Father Jacobs, uh, remembers some of my antics. And uh, hopefully, that uh, my my deeds have long been uh, forgotten or forgiven, whichever apply. <laughs> My life has uh, not been, nor will yours, a, a plotted course uh, like a road map or a recipe. It's uh, more of a zigzag with a lot of dead ends and circling back and sometimes false starts. Uh, and, and occasionally you'll find yourself lost. Uh, start on any well-marked path and soon you'll come to a fork in the road, or maybe two, or three forks. A lot of it is luck, uh, most of it's hard work. Uh, looking back over my career of the last 40 years, I can see several possible turns I could have made, but I can also see how my choices and some luck have combined to educate me and guide me to where I am today. And a great philosopher, Yogi Berra, once said, <laughs> when you come to the fork in the road, take it. I say, seize the wheel, and whenever you can, guide your destiny. So regardless of the turns that you make down the road, right now, you have thought about or have already decided to serve the public in your future. Because likely, helping people matters to you, like it does me. 
you already have made choices and taken some turns, which school you, which school you will attend, um, what major you'll, you'll, you're going to take up, and even the, the turn to join Pi Alpha Alpha. Through that choice or turn, you have distinguished yourself through academic excellence as members of the university's public administration program. So congratulations. As you can probably guess, in general, people do not choose public service because of the pay. <laughs> Frankly, if your motivation is monetary, you're in the wrong business here. Uh, this is not a profession to enter because with service, the gratification is mostly entirely from helping others. Your own satisfaction and self-actualization is really what's at key. You definitely don't get rich in the traditional sense, but your riches come from the value you get from your experiences. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate to have a front seat to history. Most recently being my experience uh, hosting the, uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, uh, his visit to the Capitol, uh, followed the next day by the President of China. So uh, the Pope visit uh, involved a lot of planning, and uh, fortunately, uh, we, we had a wonderful visit. The President of China on scale, a little less, but still uh, equally important. You've now started your journey, so let me tell you about, a little bit better about mine, hopefully see if uh, there's any crossovers or, or things that uh, hopefully my experience can help you with. You've got a little taste of my bio, you probably read a little bit of it. Uh, probably the big takeaway is I didn't stay in one job very long, you know, I hopped around a lot. Um, it, it's, it's, as I look back over the 40 years, I, I wouldn't do anything different. Um, probably uh, some of my... Uh, Worst assignments turned out to be my best experiences because I had to go in to fix things to make, you know, lemon meringue pie out of you know mud pie, and uh, again, you know, just it, it taught me a lot about myself and what I could do. I was born and raised in the Philadelphia area, as you can tell by my hand gestures and the way I move. <laughs> I joined the Navy toward the end of the Vietnam War, where I uh, became a uh, corpsman um, and medic. Uh, so to speak, and volunteered for the basic underwater demolition SEAL training, eventually serving uh, my active duty and reserve time with the SEAL teams. After my uh, service with the teams, I worked as a paramedic uh, in Montgomery County here while attending undergraduate classes here at uh, Villanova, where I met Brian for the first time and uh, was one of my guiding uh, guide-ons for uh, getting through this uh, campus because I was a challenge. Uh, after that, I joined the Norristown Police Department as a uh, uniformed patrol officer. My first assignment was walking the beat in a very tough section of that town. It taught me very quickly how to get along with people. I later became a homicide detective with the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office before moving to a career with the U.S. Secret Service in 1984. I spent 22 years with the Secret Service, moving around the East Coast with my family. And while it isn't like the movies, it, it was very, very exciting and challenging. I handled protective uh, details for four U.S. presidents and their families, supervised financial and organized crimes investigations, and conducted protective intelligence and managed security forces and protection operations uh, for the White House complex uh, after 9-11. Uh, As a special note, you know that the Secret Service is, uh, has had some tough times recently um, due to some less than flattering events. Uh, let me assure you that the Secret Service is second to none as far as uh, the dedication to the mission and the professionalism of their agents. It is currently be led, being led by Joe Clancy, an alumni of uh, Villanova, a good friend and uh, a close colleague. And uh, he's got a tough job, but uh, their phoenix will rise and uh, they will be stronger for it. So, uh, you know, in, in your prayers and your thoughts, just, uh, you know, keep them positive because they will come through this. And, and a lot, and again, on that note, a lot of agencies through hit bumps in the road, and that's part of what we have to deal with as, as leaders uh, of organizations, especially in, in, in the public uh, service domain. And you see examples of that, you know, almost every day above the fold in the newspaper. It's really about the leadership of those organizations that get them through those turbulent times. And we'll talk about that a little bit. In 2006, I moved to the private industry after retiring from the Secret Service, where I was still in a service-oriented uh, uh, focus uh, on, the, on the homeland security uh, communications and inter interoperability challenges. As you remember, uh, post 9 11, well, 9 11 really highlighted how nobody was talking to each other. They couldn't talk on their radio systems, they, they spoke different languages, uh, essentially, and, and did very, very little um, 
uh, very little effort was put into to getting to know each other's domain and how they could work together. In 2007, an interesting year, I, I hearken back that it was a year that uh, we were in Iraq and we were uh, taking horrific casualties from a weapon called the Improvised Explosive Device, IEDs, homemade bombs. I was asked to join the Department of the Defense uh, and, and a, a specific organization that was stood up to deal with that problem called the Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization. It's a mouthful, but we called it GIADO. I leveraged my military special operations, law enforcement intelligence, and intelligence experience to pursue the insurgent and terrorist networks employing the IEDs as this horrific West weapon system that was being used against our forces. This is what was responsible for most of the fatalities and, and almost all of our warriors coming home uh, with a few less body parts than they went you know, overseas with. Choosing one path doesn't mean abandoning your dreams. I truly believe that everything happens for a reason. My public service career was initially born out of a family emergency when I was a young teenager, where I felt helpless in assisting one of my sisters critically injured in a bicycle accident at one Easter afternoon, vowing that I would never be unprepared and disadvantaged again. I went and I got first aid training and I became a volunteer in my local uh, rescue squad. This was my first of four defining moments that shaped me. Everyone has something that influences different periods of their life. And I'm sure I, I could ping every one of you and you could recount one, two, three things that have influenced the way you went, uh, the direction that you've gone and, and some of the decisions that you've made. My SEAL training taught me teamwork. It taught me that I could do things that I never thought possible. And most importantly, it gave me a sense of my limitations a very powerful sense of self-awareness and personal capability. Next occurred on 9-11, where I found myself between the World Trade Center towers. I should have been dead about five times that day, but survived for a reason. A lot of the credit goes to my prior training and a mission, new mission focus that really was, was directed at going after those responsible for that attack. It was kind of my, my healing um, after going through that and spending about three months at ground zero. Last, my son, having witnessed the events and aftermath of 9-11, followed in my footsteps as a US Navy SEAL and went to war for this nation. The classified DOD operations and intelligence center that I ran directly supported his operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. I came full circle back to the SEAL community from which I started. These events and experiences have helped me define who I am and what motivates me. There have been many twists and curves in both my life and my career. The most recent turn has brought me to the United States Senate, where I have served since January of this past year as the 40th Senate Sergeant at Arms and doorkeeper. The Sergeant at Arms, which is the term that we generally use, the doorkeeper part is from, from uh, a tradition of, uh, uh, if you can believe this, years ago, uh, they actually had to hold people inside the Senate chamber just so that they could do the business of the nation. So the, uh, the original job of the Senate Sergeant at Arms was to keep the senators in one place so that they could do their votes and do the business. Uh, now it's, it, it's, it's morphed into a, a quite larger responsibility. I'm elected by the, the Senate uh, uh, senators. Uh, so I'm an, one of two officers of the Senate, uh, the other one being the Secretary of the Senate. It's a nonpartisan position, even though I'm, I'm nominated by the majority leader, and basically I serve the uh, senators and their, and their offices. Most people, even those who live and work in Washington, really don't understand what the Office of the Sergeant at Arms does, but that isn't surprising. You see, it's not a typical job. It is high, it's a high-profile position, most predominantly noticed at the President's State of the Union address when my counterpart in the House of Representatives and I escort the President onto the House floor. Most recently, as I said, I had the distinct honor of escorting Pope Francis into the chamber for his historic address to a joint se session of Congress. Probably the only time, well, at least the first time and the only time that I've ever seen the Congress so well behaved. <laughs> <coughs> When not wearing my uh, chief of protocol hat, one of the three that I wear, the Office of the Sergeant at Arms is a uh, service-oriented organization for the United States Senate with thousands of employees who work around the clock to keep things running and to keep things safe. 
The Sergeant at Arms serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Senate, which is my second hat, providing uh, services to the Senate offices such as information technology, cyber defense, parking, IDs, post office uh, operations to include mail screening because we've had uh, a number of incidents on uh, Capitol Hill where uh, anthrax and ricin have, uh, have uh, threatened our community. Uh, printing and graphics, uh, Senate photo and recording studio, the Senate page program, and yes, even the hair salon. As you can see, <laughs> it takes quite a bit of effort to keep this gray helmet of mine uh, in shape. Uh, my third hat is the uh, most important, that's the Chief Law Enforcement Officer, where I'm in charge of the safety and security of the members, staff, and visitors to the U.S. Capitol, Senate office building, and district offices in all 50 states. The U.S. Capitol Police Chief and his department of over 1,800 sworn officers and agents report to me as the chairman of the uh, Capitol Police Board. As you can see, at the Sergeant at Arms, as with other public service organizations, public servants play an instrumental role in our society, always aiming to deliver the best and highest quality services possible to promote and achieve a transparent organization and to be cognizant of the best use of public funds. But we also recognize these are unsettling times for public servants who face challenges such as budget cuts, fewer workers causing increased workloads, negative public scrutiny about federal employees, and some of it is quite well deserved, and even the possibility in a couple months of government shutdown. Remember that in difficult times that either you lead your people or your organization becomes a functioning uh, glob of disarray. Keeping morale at a level that still entices workers to deliver the best and the highest quality services can be difficult in these times. With low morale comes mediocre work. When you're out of school and perhaps only a few years later leading an organization, remember to communicate with your staff, reminding and explaining to them the reasons for what you do. We all should take a point to get out of our offices and to talk to employees about issues they feel are important. Remember, your staff members are your foundation, and without them, your organization would crumble. In a frantic work week, which they all tend to be, a boss can get stuck in his or her office, fielding meetings, phone calls, and visitors. But a leader recognizes the need to make time to speak to those employees who have chosen public service as their career. You have to get down to the deck plates, and you have to get to the ground truth. Otherwise, you're going to be riding around without any clothes on one day. I serve the senators, but it is also incumbent on me to serve the people who work for my organization and to listen to them. Your greatest ideas on productivity in delivering mail can come from those who deliver it. Your greatest ideas on physical security can come from an officer on the street who stands at a barrier or a magnetometer checkpoint. Your greatest ideas on acquiring graphics or quality graphics can come from the employee who runs the machines in the print shop. Your greatest ideas on keeping the brass or the tile floors best polished can come from your folks in the facilities who are do doing just that on the midnight shift while you're at home sleeping. I'm sure you get the, the idea. Don't always go to the top administrators to seek ideas to push your agency forward. And you don't always have to go outside for solutions either because you have the knowledge base at the ready in the form of devoted and experienced employees. They, divert, they deserve a vote. Remember, although you may have just started thinking about a particular system or procedure, there are people who have been thinking about it or doing it eight hours a day, five to seven days a week. And they've done it for many, many years. They know what is working well, but they also know what could work better and often have ideas on how things better, could be made better, leverage that knowledge. The most important aspect of leading a healthy organization is to establish relationships through good communications, as I said before. In doing that, we build trust and confidence. Communication is not, it, communication is not effective unless you listen, unless you make yourself stop and really listen. It only, it's only then that you can properly assess and digest information. Communication skills are paramount. We need to use them to remind our employees of their relevance. In our case, 
to Senate offices, allowing Congress to do their job, and without sounding corny, ultimately corny, ultimately upholding the democracy of this great nation. Now I'm going to digress a little bit to comment on the current situation um, that we see in the profession of policing right now. It's a very, very tough times as a result of Ferguson, New York, Charleston, other places where uh, the police uh, and the community have um, have seen a, a very, very serious divide, divide and, and, and lack of communication develop. And in some cases, I, I think that what has happened is that uh, the police are supposed to be a reflection of the society that they're, 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 they're sworn to protect and serve. And sometimes um, maybe the police or it's the society, one or the other, are moving in different directions I don't think it's intentionally, I, I, but I think it's by virtue of the way societies evolve and they become disconnected. And when you start seeing police officers standing behind their badge and their uniform and using it like a wall, then that doesn't really afford effective communications. I also think that in some cases the public has lost the, the ability to communicate with the police. They almost feel intimidated or they don't feel that they have a a clean, open avenue of communication. So we have to work very hard on trying to improve that and narrow that gap and improve those lines of, of uh, dialogue. I think that we're going to get through this. You know, as I talked to Father Jacobs at dinner, uh, we saw this in the, in the 70s. We saw this in the late 80s. Uh, you know, we've been over these bumps before or through, you know, we've had rough times and we've gotten through it. It's just that we, we have to open up the, uh, the, the lines of communication, we have to listen, and we have to, I think, also open our aperture of expectations. The most important aspect of leading a healthy organization is to establish, and, and again, as I said, relationships. I knew from early on that I wanted to be a leader. Note that I didn't say that it was my goal to become a manager. There are many differences between leaders and managers. I'm sure you teach that. <laughs> Leaders move forward. Leaders are innovative. And they try to find the way to get the best from their people as well as give their best. Managers maintain the status quo, check the right boxes, stay in their comfort zone, and embrace bureaucracy and process. Leaders challenge assumptions and are always on the lookout for ways to do things better. Now, I'm not throwing down on managers, but they're my opinion, that's my view that leaders tend to be a lot more forward leading. Good leaders are self-critical and can see themselves objectively and leaders are also willing to accept risk versus managers who avoid risk at any cost, including the advancement of an organization at times. Leaders have to make decisions and also have to realize that those who work under them should feel empowered to make decisions also. You will learn that not every one of those decisions will go well and you know that you will ultimately be held responsible for, for those decisions. But you learn from both your mistakes and your successes. That is what a forward-leaning learning organization does. No one is a born leader. You have to learn to become a good leader. Unfortunately, a lot of how people learn to be good leaders is because of bad experiences, having to work for bad leaders. But that goes back to destiny. Everything happens for a reason. You might not see it now, but at some point you will, again, Learn from your mistakes. See the lesson in every experience. Let me share with you a few basic tenets of being a leader that, I've al that have always worked for me. One, treat people how you want to be treated. You've heard that before, but it is so true. Respect others, no matter where they come from. Never take away anyone's dignity. Establish relationships, particularly through face-to-face th -face communications. Build trust and confidence, be fair, and remember, your personal integrity is yours to keep or give away. But once you give it away, you'll never get it back. This will haunt you throughout your career. So many, so many managers, leaders, executives in the government have lost that role. Not all just enough that it is making our society uncomfortable with some of the things that are going on right now. No matter what title I've held, 
I've always tried to lead the, by those principles. Things are more complicated now and move at a faster rate. But the principles are the same. People have different backgrounds and different beliefs. We don't have to all agree, but we must exhibit respect. I want to remind you that no matter how high up you are, everyone has a boss. Here at the Senate, I have over 4,000 employees reporting to me, but I report to 100 senators who have entrusted me with this position at my home. My wife's the boss. <laughs> so I, uh, yes, dear. Just as I started as a patrol officer in Pennsylvania, you all start somewhere and with great energy and fresh ideas. Hopefully you will have a boss who listens, a leader. This, this is how an organization becomes great. That is how we continue as a great nation. If an employee understands the importance of the role, even in tough times and uncertain environments, such as when the threat of a government shutdown looms, their worth is validated and they realize that they are important and they contribute. I cannot stress it enough. If you aspire to ever lead an organization, it is important to remember that you must help your employees to be the best public servants that they can be, ultimately making your company or organization the best it can be. Doing so is a delicate mixture of listening, observing, rewarding, and yes, also disciplining. When necessary, you need to take them to the woodshed, and you need to hold people accountable for what they're responsible for. And you, you do that through communication, you do that for, through sound direction, of what your expectations are. But also paramount is, is being fair. And if they see that you're fair across the board and that you're open to everyone, then this process goes a lot easier if, if you're showing, other than if, if you're showing biases. People treat you with respect because you treat them with dignity, respect, and fairness. I want to impart upon you again, all this is tied to good communications. Don't let yourself become so focused on one idea that you see only what you want to see. You close yourself off, you know, you, you, you only do what you want to do. Listening does not, doesn't mean you have to automatically agree with everything you're presented with or totally abandon your focus. It means welcoming competitive analysis. You have to have intellectual courage. Do not surround yourself with cheerleaders. Frankly, you have to get off your phone or come out from behind your desk and talk to people to face, face to face. You, you learn so much in that face to face contact. You sense so much more than just communicating through an email or over the phone or through a VTC. Meet and get to know people. Go break bread with them, either during work, in some cases after work. I cannot stress enough how rewarding a simple conversation with another person can be and how these small conversations, which seem trivial, can impact th great things down the road. Let me take you back to a time when I was walking the beat in that tough neighborhood in Norristown. I had to be smart because there was no way I was going to play a, that tough cop role. You can see the hulking figure that I am <laughs> commands immediate respect. <laughs> Otherwise, I was going to go home every night uh, you know, with, with quite a few uh, lumps and bumps. I made a point to get out to that community that I served, introducing myself, and I became acquainted with people who lived there. A mutual respect grew from those conversations. The community understood that I had a job to do, preserving their safety, although they might not like everything I was required to do as a police officer, they came to know me as a person. A cop who stopped and talked to them. We developed a mutual understanding, a mutual respect, and a mutual admiration that one day saved my life. I was in an all-out physical fight, outnumbered by a crew of violent drug dealers, and frankly about to suffer serious injury and, and maybe even death. And out of nowhere, this community suddenly surged around me, beating back and holding down the gang that I was fighting until other police units arrived. Why? Because they knew me. I was their cop. I was their beat officer. I wasn't just a faceless person. I, I was somebody that they knew and, and they had come to have comp confidence and trust in. Those quick conversations that I made, sure to engage in, came back to reward me. Not in a monetary fashion, but by ensuring my safety. 
No matter what turn you ultimately choose, I implore every one of you to serve with integrity. Become that public servant or public official of depth with real interest in what is best for the most people in your organization, because you're not going to make them all happy, your community, city, state, or nation. Become that business or corporate leader whose firm, company, or partnership stands for quality products, services, and customer safety, honesty, all provided by employees who are fairly compensated for their excellent service and justly and more than adequately treated. Become that official who enforces the law fairly on the street, defends one charged with crime, or provides justice and compassion from the bench. Those are the great foundations of a meaningful life, which make it worth the effort and the sacrifice as a public servant. Lastly, remember to take time for yourself and your family. Find the time. I have always said a good leader takes not one week, but a two-week vacation. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Through experience. <laughs> if you take a week, everything, every decision, ends up in your inbox. I have found, however, that decisions typically have to be made about day 10. Therefore, if you take two weeks, people who, have, who, who you have entrusted to make decisions are required to step up and make them. There is a chain of command in organizations for a reason, and we need to challenge those who work for us to step up and make the hard choices. You ultimately will be the one held accountable if a decision goes wrong. But again, that is how we grow. As an, that's how you grow your employee, and that's how you grow as an organization. Don't forget where you came from. Look at me now, back here where I came from. You look at my bio, and sure, it looks impressive, but truly impress, impressive is what I've learned from every encounter that I've had throughout my career. It's not the people that have had the fancy titles in front of their names or all the letters behind their names that have impressed me the most in life. It is those folks who were just good people. They worked it hard for what they did. They were committed in what they were doing. And most of them were focused on helping others. So in closing, remember whatever turn you take at those forks in the road, you will learn from each one. They will build on your career and provide new opportunities and always work to be a good leader. It's, it's a hard job. It's every day I work at it. I'm not saying that I'm a good leader, but every day I work at good, being a good leader. Honestly, I don't know how much of this specifically applies to you right now, but if in 5, 15, 25, or 40 years from now, even one thing that I've shared with you has had impact, then I will feel that I've served you tonight. Now, I'm not a real touchy-feely guy. You know, I'm not a, an aficionado, aficionado of the, the fine arts, but I, I want to read a poem to you that you'll probably say after I read it, why didn't you read that up front and deliver the punchline, you know, at the beginning? Because this is pretty much what I've been talking about. This poem is called The Dash. It's by Linda Ellis, 1996. I read of a man who, who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that still can be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? And again, by Linda Ellis, 
So in closing, life is all about the adventure and how you define your dash. Thank you. I'm honored to be standing here before you today. I'm happy to take on any of your questions should you have them.